was August 16th in 2002, and a pilot in the United States Air Force with a call sign Johnny Bravo was flying with his wingman in their A-10 Warthogs above a valley in Afghanistan. An A-10 is a slow-flying, heavily armored, low-flying aircraft designed to provide uh, ground support for troops below. And on this night, they were told to hang out above this valley in case they're needed while a team of 22 Special Operations Forces were making their way through the valley, attempting to extract what the government likes to call a high-value target. Up above the clouds, it was beautiful. The moon was bright, the stars were out, and the moonlight lit up the clouds like the snow had just fallen. Down beneath the clouds, it was a very different story. These Special Operations Forces were in this middle of this valley felt incredibly uneasy. They felt like they were being watched and they felt something bad was gonna happen. The only contact they had with the planes above with over the radio, they couldn't see each other obviously because of the cloud cover and Johnny Bravo could sense their unease. So he decided he was gonna go down and have a look, go down and fly beneath the cloud cover to see what was going on down below. And as he pointed his plane down, he told his wingman to hang out while he went to have a look, the call came over the radio, troops in contact. Troops in contact is what they say when they need help, when they come under effective fire and they need someone to come and help them. And that call came over the radio. Johnny Bravo had never heard it in combat before. This was his first time. Now there was no question he had to get down there. So he flies down through the cloud, the turbulence throws him about, and he finally pops out beneath the cloud and he's less than a thousand feet above the ground. He's also flying in a valley mountains on both sides. And the sight that greets him is a sight he's never seen in his life, not in training, not in the movies. There was so much fire coming from both sides of the valley, it literally lit up the entire valley. What's more, this is 2002 and our aircraft did not yet have ground-hugging radar. So he could hit a mountain at any time. And he was using old Russian maps, that's the best we had. So he picked a position where he saw the fire coming from and he started laying down suppressing fire and he literally counted out loud. He knew his speed, he knew his distance, he did some quick, calculation, his, quick calculations in his head and he counted out loud so he would avoid hitting the mountain. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000 while, while he lays down the suppressing fire. 5, 1,000, 6, 1,000. He pulls hard on the stick, pulls a high G turn, goes around again. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. 5, 1, 000. Good hits, good hits, he hears over the radio. And he goes again, 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. Fuel is fine, runs out of ammunition. Flies up above the cloud and tells his wingman, you need to get back down there. And so the two of them fly back into the valley, wing to wing, three feet apart from each other. Johnny Bravo counts while his wingman lays down suppressing fire. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. And again, 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. That night, 22 Americans went home alive with zero casualties. I got to meet Johnny Bravo, pretty low-key guy. Wasn't looking for a medal, wasn't looking for a bonus, wasn't looking for a promotion, wasn't looking for a reality TV show, just doing his J-O-B, as he puts it. He told me that he believes there are fates worse than death. One fate worse than death is accidentally killing your own, Another fate worse than death is going home alive when 22 don't. So I start thinking to myself, where do people like Johnny Bravo come from? You know, you, you hear these stories of heroism with people who risk their lives for others. And the question is, why do they do it? Dakota Meyer, a Marine who was awarded the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor, ran into enemy fire to pull out wounded and fallen Marines, disobeying a direct order, was told to stay put, and yet he did it multiple times. And when he was getting the medal, the president said to him, did you think you were going to die? To which he replied, no, I knew I was going to die. Where do people like this come from? People who are willing to risk their lives for others. My initial conclusion is they're just better than us. They're just better people. That's the best I could come up with. And the more I started to learn and the more time I got to spend around some of these remarkable people, I started to realize it's not in their DNA. It's in the environment in which they live and it's in the environment in which they work. In other words, 
every single one of us has the capacity to be like Johnny Bravo. In the military, they give medals to people who are willing to sacrifice themselves so that others may gain. In business, we give bonuses to people who are willing to sacrifice others so that we may gain. We've got it backwards. And so the question is, if it's environmental, how do we create the environments in which people like Johnny Bravos can exist? As it turns out, the concept is very, very old. If you go back to caveman times, for example, the world was filled with danger, right? There were all of these forces trying to kill us. Nothing personal, things like the weather, lack of resources, maybe a saber-toothed tiger, nothing personal. All of these forces trying to end our lives. And so we evolved into these social animals where we lived in tribes. <laughs> because if we felt safe amongst each other, we could organize our talents and our strength to work together to face the dangers and seize the opportunities. It's the exact same thing in business. The world is filled with dangers that are constant and unpredictable, things like the ups and downs of the stock market, things like new technologies emerging that could render your business or some business model obsolete overnight, your competitors who are sometimes trying to put you out of business, but at the very minimum are trying to frustrate your growth or steal your customers. All of these things threatening us, nothing personal, they're a constant, we have no control over them. The only variable is the environment inside the organization, the culture in which we live and the culture in which we work. That is entirely within our control. And if we feel safe amongst each other, if we feel like we belong, if we trust each other, it means we're, we're more likely to work together to face the dangers and seize the opportunities on the outside. If we fear each other, it means we'll be forced to invest our own time and our own energy to protect each other from each other, to protect ourselves from each other, and the result of which weakens an organization and exposes the organization to greater dangers. It's this circle of safety that needs to exist. Aesop, as in Aesop's fables, described it best. He talks about four oxen that stand tail to tail, and no matter from which angle the lion attacks, he's always met with horns. But due to infighting and disagreements, the oxen break apart and graze in different parts of the field, and one by one, the lion eats them all. So the question is then, if this is so important, and it's absolutely essential to our survival, I mean, this is the reason the human race has survived. We existed on this planet 50,000 years ago at the same time other hominid species existed, and yet we survived and they didn't. We're not the strongest, we're not the fastest, and yet we survived because we worked together. We did it together. It is the only way. So the question is, is how do you create a circle of safety? How does this thing even come about? As it turns out, the human body, human behavior, functions exactly the same way as an organization. In many organizations, if you want to direct the behavior of someone, you offer them some sort of incentive or maybe a threat of punishment. You set a goal and you tell them that if you hit that goal, you will get an incentive. And guess what? People work towards that goal. Not our goal, it's somebody else's goal, but we work towards it, right? We do the same thing with our kids, right? We tell them we want a certain behavior. If they achieve that behavior, if they do that goal, they finish that chore, They'll get some sort of bonus or a gold star or a little bit of pocket money or something. And guess what? It works. The human body works exactly the same way. Inside our body are a set of chemicals attempting to direct our behavior to do things that are in our best interest. If you've ever had a feeling of pride, status, love, trust, loyalty, happiness, joy, all of these feelings that I will generically call happiness, are controlled by chemicals inside our bodies, incentives. And all feelings of happiness can basically be boiled down to four chemicals. Endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin, EDSO. And they're all trying hard to get us to repeat behavior in our best interest. Let me explain what they are. Endorphins. Endorphins, we've all heard of the endorphin rush or the runner's high, we've, we know what this is. Endorphins have one purpose and one purpose only, to mask physical pain. That's it, that's all they do. So when that runner is out there pushing himself harder than he's ever pushed before, feels great, feels awesome. And so he keeps pushing further and further. And at the end of the run, still, still feels fantastic. And then about an hour later is in pain 
for damage he caused to his muscles about an hour before, because the endorphins ran out, right? Now, the caveman reason for endorphins is much more practical, because we're not the strongest, and we're not the fastest, and we still had to eat, we still had to hunt, we still had to gather, so how are we going to do this? As it turns out, the human body is made for endurance. We can track an animal for hours and hours and hours and miles and miles and miles. And though we may not be as fast as a gazelle, we can wear a gazelle out. And if we get tired or exhausted, we can't give up. We still have to bring the food back. And so the human body is designed in a manner that allows us to feel good when we push our bodies a little further so that we will continue. And we crave that feeling of endorphins. So much so that we would volunteer to go hunting. I had such a good time hunting yesterday. I'd love to go again tomorrow, the same way we crave exercise. As a little aside, this is why laughing feels good. When you laugh, you're actually convulsing your internal organs. And to mask that pain, endorphins are released, which is why it feels good to laugh. We've all been in the position where you laugh so much that you say to somebody, stop, stop, it hurts. It's because the endorphins have run out. Now, in our modern day and age with supermarkets and cars, there's really no practical need for endorphins for survival. Pretty much the only way you get it is through heavy exercise and other strenuous activities like that. Dopamine. Dopamine is the feeling you get when you find something you're looking for or you accomplish something you set out to accomplish. So you know that amazing feeling you get when you cross something off your to-do list? That's dopamine, right? When you hit your goal, that amazing sense of winning, like, yes! right? That's dopamine. When you find something you're looking for, oh my God, I have to have this pair of shoes. That's dopamine. It's why we love Google. It's why we love eBay, right? You type it in, it comes up, you're like, <gasps> right? That's dopamine, right? I went out to run some errands one morning and I had, you know, some little piece of scrap paper. I had my, my to-do list written down and I was out there going, running my errands and I walked past a store that I had to run an errand, but I'd forgotten to write it on my list and walking past reminded me. So I went into the store, completed my errand, and when I came out, I then wrote it on the list and crossed it out. Because I wanted the feeling. I wanted the feeling of accomplishment, right? Um, the historical reason for dopamine, again, is much more practical. When we eat, dopamine is released. It's one of the reasons we enjoy eating food, is because it actually feels good, because our body is trying to encourage us to repeat the behaviors that get us food. In other words, repeat the behaviors that are in our best interest. If we only ate because we intellectually knew it was important. We'd only start eating when we were starving. It wouldn't be a very good system for survival. And so again, Mother Nature's provided a wonderful system that will go doing things. We don't need it now, now, now. So for example, <clears throat> if you'd go out for a, a wander and in the distance you'd see an apple tree or a gazelle or something, you get a small hit of dopamine. What that says is go after that thing. And so what it does is it focuses us. It allows us to stay focused on our goals so that we'll accomplish our goals. And so we start making progress towards the goal. And as we see the tree get a little bigger, we feel like we're making progress. And another little shot of dopamine keeps us focused. And as we get closer and closer, we get another little shot of dopamine, another little shot of dopamine, until we finally get to the tree. We're like, yes, that amazing sense of accomplishment, huge surge of dopamine, right? This is why we're told you have to write down your goals. If you want to achieve your goals, you have to write them down. We're visual animals. There's some truth to this, right? We're no good with amorphous, right? You will get a bonus if you accomplish more. How much more? More. Wouldn't work very well. Give me a target. Give me something specific. Give me something I can see. We're very, very visual animals, right? This is why a vision statement must be something that we can see or imagine in our mind's eye, right? That's why it's called vision. You have to be able to see it. If it's amorphous, it doesn't inspire us. Most corporate visions are useless to be the biggest, to be the most respected. They don't mean anything to us. We don't even know what the metric is. Respected by whom? Your customer, your employees, your mother, yourself, who? We don't even know how you're measuring it. It doesn't inspire us. Martin Luther King had a great vision. He imagined a world in which little black children would play on the playground with little white children. We can imagine that. And if that's the kind of world that inspires us, we'll direct our energies towards that goal. And every milestone we pass that makes us f let us feel like we're making progress excites us to keep going and heading towards that goal. It's not the metrics. The metrics are the steps that we're counting to let us feel that we're making progress towards the larger goal. It's the destination, it's the apple tree in the distance that matters. This is what dopamine does. It keeps us focused on the place we're trying to get us and rewards us with an amazing sense of accomplishment or that we're doing something that we've been trying to do. We are progress machines. 
However, dopamine comes with a warning. It is highly, highly, highly addictive. Here are some other things that release dopamine. Gambling, nicotine, alcohol, your cell phone, right? Think about how gambling works. We know what the apple tree is, right? It's three sevens, and we know what happens when you get three sevens. You win a jackpot, right? And so what we do is we start gambling. We get two sevens. We feel like we've made progress, so we get excited, and we keep going and going. We got one seven that's okay. I know that I'm on the way. I got another seven was just up there. We know what it looks like, and we keep going and going and going. Except it's not a fair fight. It's not a fair game. It's not us versus nature. It's not us versus ourselves. It's us versus casino, and it's a rigged game. And like all addiction, in time, we waste resources, we waste money, we waste time, and we eventually destroy all of our relationships. That's what all addictions do. In companies, we can become addicted to performance. There are many companies that use dopamine as the primary means to drive behavior. If you hit the target, you will get a financial bonus. We reward individual behavior with, an in, with a dopamine incentive. And what happens is we become addicted in an unhealthy culture to performance. And like all addiction, we sometimes lie, cheat, and steal to get that next fix. And this is what happens in unhealthy companies. They become fixated with the number to the point where people are stabbing each other in the back to make the number. It's the organization they built. They did it them to themselves. Our cell phones, also equally addic addictive. Yes, we all hate all the email we get. What we love is the bing, the buzz, the flash, the beep. Oh my God, it feels so good, right? They say that if you wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is crave a drink, that you might be an alcoholic. Well, if you wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is check your phone before you even get out of bed, you might be addicted to your phone. If you walk from room to room in your own home holding your phone, you might be an addict. If you're driving in your car and your phone goes beep and you can't wait the 10 or 15 minutes to get to wherever you're going, you have to read it now, odds are very high you have an addiction. And if you have to reply, it says, are you free for dinner next Thursday? And you have to reply now, you can't wait the 10 minutes, odds are very high you have a dopamine addiction. And all of those Gen Ys out there like, like to tell us that because they grew up with the technology, that they can, they're better at multitasking, then why do you keep crashing your cars while you're texting? The fact is you're not better at multitasking. We've got an entire generation that has basically grown up with a dopamine addiction is what has happened. And like all addictions, in time, we waste resources, we waste time, and we destroy relationships. I went out for dinner recently, and I sat next to a mother and her daughter out for dinner together, and they were sitting there texting the whole time. I don't think they exchanged a word. That's called destroying relationships. When people go out with their friends and they sit there and look down, why are they texting their friends? I thought they're out with their friends. Over time, it makes us feel lonely. It doesn't make us feel loved, because we're not actually feeling the love. We're feeling the dopamine hit of the text arriving. That's why we keep checking and we send more texts and we send more emails because we want the reply, we want the ding, we want the buzz, we want the flash. It feels good. But the problem with dopamine is it's short term. It's hits, it's goodbye, it's instant gratification and then it's over and you have to go look for the next one and the next one and the next one. That's why it's addictive. These are selfish chemicals. You don't need anybody's help to get them. Go for a run, accomplish your goals, go through your checklist. You'll feel good. The problem is it's short lived. This is why we have the other two chemicals. These are the social chemicals. These are the chemicals that protect us and allow us to build societies and cultures. Remember, there's huge value in working and living together. What it means is I can fall asleep at night and trust that someone else will watch for danger. If I don't trust the people within my tribe, then I can't go to sleep at night. Not a very good system for survival. And so if we don't trust each other, it doesn't work. And this is why these two chemicals exist. These are the basis of trust and loyalty and all that warm and fuzzy stuff. This is where the balanced culture comes into play. These chemicals are perfectly fine when they're in balance with the other chemicals. Serotonin. Serotonin is the feeling of pride and status. It's the feeling we get when we have public recognition. It's why the SSR award feels so good. It's because we want to know that we are valued by our company, valued by our tribe. And when our tribe recognizes our value and our contribution to them, it feels amazing. We cry. It's overwhelming. We all crave that feeling. That's why this is very important, the gathering of people. It's why we have the Oscars. It's why we have commencement ceremonies. Technically, all you need to graduate 
is you need to pay your bills, collect enough credits, fulfill your minimum requirements, and you can have a diploma. That's technically all you need. Technically, they could just send you an email that says, congratulations, you've graduated college. Enclosed, please find the PDF of your diploma. Feel free to print it out. PDF, I mean, PS, magna cum laude. Wouldn't feel the same, wouldn't feel good. And so we have a ceremony, and who do we invite to the ceremony? Our friends, our family, our teachers, all of those within our community who have sacrificed to help us achieve this great thing. And we can feel the day. When that young college graduate walks up on the stage and she walks over to take her diploma, the moment she grabs that diploma, she has this surge of serotonin. She feels her confidence rise. Serotonin has a lot to do with self-confidence. She feels her status rise. She feels good. She feels rewarded from the community. She feels awesome. And here's the best part. At the exact moment she feels her status rise and that sense of pride, her parents sitting in the audience also get a surge of serotonin and they feel proud too. What serotonin is attempting to do is reinforce the relationship between parent and child, boss and employee, coach and player. It's trying to reward the caregiver and the one who is cared for. And think about it, when we give an award to someone, who's the per first person they thank? God, my parents, my boss, whomever they believe was watching over them that allowed them to achieve this great thing was the first person they thank sharing the serotonin. Or if we give the award to the boss, or the coach, what's the first thing they say? I couldn't have done it without my team. And they look up and you go, we love you. <laughs> it's sharing the serotonin, it's reinforcing the relationship so that we will look after each other, so that I will protect you and push you to advance and you will make me proud. And then you'll pass it on to the people one day when they're in your care. The history of serotonin is fascinating. I call it the leadership chemical because it's the chemical of leaders, right? Leaders have status in our society. They walk around like this, right? You can tell they have this sense of pride, right? The reason we have leaders is actually quite practical. We used to live in populations of between 100 and 150 people, which presents a very practical problem. We're all hungry. Somebody brings back food, dumps it on the ground. We all rush in to eat. If you're lucky enough to be built like a linebacker, you will shove your way to the front. If you're the artistic one of the family, you get an elbow in the face. Not a good system for survival. Because that means when the guy who punched you in the face is sleeping at night and danger rears its ugly head, odds are very high you're not going to wake him to alert him. He just punched you in the face this afternoon. Bad system for survival. And so we evolved into these hierarchical animals. We're constantly judging each other. Who's alpha? Who's beta? We're constantly assessing who's more senior than us. And it's not a fixed scale, it's a relative scale. You know, physical strength may be desired if you're a wrestler. Creativity may be the, the, the standard if you're an artist. We've all felt it. We've all felt it. If you've ever met someone and you're nervous when you meet them, you're not the alpha. And we've all met someone and we can sense that they're nervous meeting us, you're the alpha. And what we do is we defer to our alphas. We naturally, voluntarily take a step back and allow our alphas to eat first. We allow those who are higher up in the hierarchy to eat before us, naturally, right? So the alphas get first choice of meat and first choice of mate. The rest of us may not get the best choice of meat, but we get to eat eventually and we don't get an elbow in the face when we do good system. To this day, we are perfectly comfortable with those who outrank us in the hierarchy getting preferential treatment. Not a single person in this room has any problem with someone more senior than you getting paid more. You might think they're an ass, but you have no problem with them making more money. No one here has a problem with somebody more senior than us having a better parking space or a nicer, a nicer office. It doesn't bother us at all. In fact, sometimes we even expect it. Can you imagine if the President of the United States had to carry his own luggage? We'd be incensed. What? We can't get someone to carry his luggage? He's the President of the United States, for heaven's sakes. I will do it. It would be an honor. And we proudly carry the luggage for the person who's higher up in the hierarchy. Look how proud we are. Happy to do menial labor for somebody we admire. If Steven Spielberg showed up right here, right now, you would hold the door open for him, I promise you. And you'd go home and you'd tell your spouse, honey, I held the door open for Steven Spielberg. How cool is that? How come you don't advertise when you hold the door open for anybody else? It's because we're proud to serve those who are higher in the hierarchy, which is why we're always vying to be the leaders, which is why guys show off in bars because they want to appear to be the alpha. 
Because it earns you more respect, it earns you more, and it raises your status. But like I said, it was very practical. It was about food. It was about allowing the alphas to eat first so the rest of us wouldn't have to get an elbow in the face when we do. But it comes at a cost. As General Flynn taught me, the cost of leadership is self-interest. You see, the group isn't stupid. We don't give the alpha all of that special treatment and all of our love and fill them up with serotonin and pride and confidence for nothing. There's a responsibility that comes with leadership. We expect that the guy who's actually stronger, actually better fed, and actually filled with more confidence because they're surging with serotonin, that when danger rears his ugly head, we expect that person to run the towards the danger to save us. That's the cost of leadership. This is why we're so viscerally offended by some of these banking CEOs with their disproportionately high salaries. It's not the number. It's that we know that they sat back and watched their people sacrifice while they reaped the benefits. Worse, sometimes they sacrificed their people so they could make more. And that, that violates a deeply, deeply ingrained social rule deep inside of us that's been there for 50,000 years. That's what pisses us off. What if I told you that we're going to give Nelson Mandela a $150 million bonus? You got a problem with that? Nope. What if I told you we're going to give Mother Teresa a $250 million bonus? Anybody have an issue? Nope. It's not the numbers. We are happy to pay deference to our leaders when we feel confident that our leaders, when it matters most, would sacrifice themselves for us. That's the cost of leadership. Leadership is not a rank. It is a choice. It has nothing to do with where you are in the pecking order of the organization. You can be the highest ranking person in the company and you cannot be a leader. You can be the lowest ranking person and you can be a leader. Are you willing to look out for the person to the right of you and the person to the left of you? Are you willing, when it matters most, to sacrifice your comfort so that others may advance? This is what it means when we say leaders eat last. If you visit any chow hall in the world, any Marine Corps chow hall in the world, you will see that when it's time to eat, the Marines will line up in rank order. They will put the most junior Marine first and the most senior Marine at the end. Though in the chow hall it is symbolic, what it's saying is, is that our leaders would be willing to feed those in our care before we even feed ourselves, just like a parent. The shootings that recently happened in Kenya in the shopping mall. We had the remarkable opportunity to see what was going on inside. Usually we see the photographs from the aftermath. And in, just by f f a fluke, there was a New York Times photographer nearby who ran into the mall during the shootings. And there are these remarkable photographs while the incident is going down. There was one photograph that he took in that mall that you can see on NewYorkTimes.com if you go check it out, that both haunts me and inspires me every single time I see it. It's a mother lying on top of her child. At the sound of the gun, it is a mother's instinct not to weigh the pros and the cons, not to think, what can I gain, what can I lose, but to instinctively throw themselves on top of their child, even though that may cost them their life. That is the best example of leadership I can give you. It's the instinct that when danger rears its ugly head, to throw yourself on top of those in your care so that they may live another day, even if it costs you. Great leadership is about sacrificing the numbers to save your people. Great leaders never sacrifice the people to save the numbers. Leadership is a choice, and it is a deeply ingrained social contract. And when we feel that our leaders are willing to sacrifice for us, we will repay them with our love and adoration, and most importantly, we will give our blood, sweat, and tears to see that their vision is advanced. It would make us proud. Oxytocin. Oxytocin is everyone's favorite chemical. It is the feeling of love and trust and loyalty. It's all the warm and fuzzies. It's all the unicorns and rainbows. It's the reason we love spending time with our friends. You can sit on the couch and watch TV for four hours with your friend, never utter a word, and when they go home at the end of the night, you'll say, hey, thanks for coming over, had a great time. We like the company of our friends because of oxytocin. Oxytocin is that feeling of trust, like I said. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the chemical that makes us feel secure around those in our tribe. 
I can almost guarantee you that almost every single person in this room chose the person you're sitting next to. You're sitting next to somebody you know, somebody you may have a friendship with, a relationship with. It's very uncomfortable to sit next to strangers. When we go to events and we see somebody we know, we walk over and we say hi and we sit with them, we stand with them, if they're the only other person we know. Doesn't like, we don't like sitting with strangers, it makes us feel vulnerable. And remember, we're tribal animals, we're pack animals. We wanna feel like we're in a circle of safety. We wanna feel like we're amongst people who believe what we believe, who share our values. We wanna feel that if we turn our back, they will watch our back. We can make ourselves vulnerable and they will protect us. It's the best definition of love I ever heard. It's the willingness to give someone the ability to destroy you and trust that they won't use it. That's what it means, that we do not fear each other so that we can organize ourselves to take on the outside world. Oxytocin. There are many ways you can get oxytocin. One is physical touch. This is why hugging our friends feels so good. This is why athletes high-five each other and fist bump and all this is physical touch. This is why children cling on to their parents because it makes them feel safe. I was um, witness to somebody who was in an office. We were getting an office tour somewhere and this guy fell off his chair and had a diabetic seizure. And a whole bunch of people ran in, including his colleagues, to, to help him out until the paramedics arrived, and there's not much that could be done until the paramedics arrived, but I couldn't help but notice that one of his colleagues was on her knee, rubbing his leg, saying, they'll be here soon, they'll be here soon. This, this idea of touching someone when they're in pain, it's because oxytocin makes us feel safe. It makes us feel that someone cares about us. This is an incredibly, incredibly valuable tool to forming trust. Imagine you do a business deal with someone, and you're getting ready to sign the contract, you can't wait to do business with them, they can't wait to do business with you. And just as you're about to sign the contract, that you say, this is gonna be great. And they say, no, 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 we don't need to shake hands, let's just sign the contract and let's get this going. And you go, great, we're excited too. And they go, no, 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 no. Don't need to shake your hand, we agree to all the terms, let's do it. Business has nothing to do with the rational terms on the page. It's about forming relationships with people who we think we can trust, hope we can trust, and hope that they will watch for danger when we need it. It's about a social contract. It's not the terms of the agreement. Their simple refusal to shake your hand means one of two things will happen. You will either scuttle the deal, or you will go into it nervous. That's how powerful this stuff is. This is about social contracts trust. Another way you can get oxytocin, acts of generosity, acts of human kindness. An act of human generosity is defined as giving of your time and energy with no expectation of anything in return. Money doesn't count, sorry. What if I told you that this morning I gave $500 to charity? What would you think of me? You'd be like, good for you. What, do you want a medal, right? But what if I told you that last Saturday, I gave up half my, my, uh, half my Saturday and I went and painted a school in the inner city? Then what would you think of me? You'd be like, nice, cool, I should do more, right? We as human beings put a higher premium on people who give away a non-redeemable commodity. Money is a redeemable commodity. We waste it, we make more. Time and energy, once it's spent, there's no getting it back. We've all sat in meetings and thought to ourselves, I'll never get this time back. Some of you are sitting here right now thinking, I'll never get this time back. You won't. Sorry, I got nothing for you. Those who give us the time and energy, we repay them with immense gratitude and we start to develop trust, right? This is why email doesn't work, because it's too easy. There's no sacrifice of time or energy. If I come to your house for dinner and you make me a lovely dinner, and the next day I send you a lovely email saying what a wonderful host you are and what a wonderful meal it was and how much fun I had, or three days later you receive a handwritten note from me with the exact same words in the email, which one makes you feel better? The handwritten note. Because you know it took a little bit more time and a little bit more energy for me to send it, and so it actually makes you feel better. This is why you can't send emails to say thank you to people or tell them what you think of their ideas. It's too easy, it doesn't work. Or reprimand people, it doesn't work. Email is fantastic for the exchange of ideas, for connecting people or for uh, giving information away. Hey, what time's the meeting? The meeting's at four. Here's the, the document you asked for. But to respond to someone's ideas or tell them they did a good job, stand up, walk the 30 feet, knock on their, knock next door and say, hey, 
great job in today's meeting. And they'll look at you and be like, that's all? You'll be like, that's all, and walk away. As General Flynn taught me, it's called eyeball leadership, and it really, really matters. It's the reason why great leaders roam the halls and know people's names. It's the reason why great generals visit the front lines. It's because we know that their time is valuable, and they were willing to give up some of their time just to come say hi to us, to see how we're doing. We reward that with immense gratitude, because it is a non-redeemable commodity. I was talking to some executives from a large oil company, and they were trying to convince me that they really care that their employees are fulfilled at work, to which I said, no, you don't. And they said, no, we do. And I said, no, you don't. And they said, no, 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 we do. I said, no, you don't. <laughs> so they finally said to me, Simon, what are you thinking? I said, I bet you hired some high-priced consultancy to send out an, a web survey to find out if people are fulfilled at work. And they said, well, we didn't hire a consultancy. And I said, okay, riddle me this. What if you sent your son an email? Dear son, your mother and I really care that you feel a part of this family. Please tell us candidly what you think we can do better because we love you. Love, dad. Or you walk into his room, you sit on his bed, and you say, you know, son, your mother and I really want you to feel a part of this family. Please tell me candidly what you think that we can do better because we love you and we want you to feel part of this. Which one do you think your son believes you and feels like you care? The sentiment is the same, the words are the same, the intention is the same. The only difference is in one circumstance, you sacrifice your time and your energy. It's the exact same thing as going to your kid's baseball game. You wanna be a good dad, you wanna be a good mom, you're gonna leave work early and you got your priorities in the right place and you go to the game and while you're at the game sitting in the bleachers, you're on your phone the whole time and the only time you look up is when you're here cheering. You gave your time, you didn't give your energy. I promise you, when your kid's standing on second base and there's no cheering or anything, and your kid looks over to you and you're looking down, your kid does not feel that you care. Just stay at work, it's probably better. Another way to give oxytocin, like I said, acts of generosity, giving of your time and energy with no expectation of anything in return. I was walking down the streets in New York City, and a guy in front of me, his backpack opened, a bunch of papers fell out. Didn't think much of it, I simply bent down, helped sort of, gathered up the papers and handed them back to him and pointed out that his backpack had opened. Small act of generosity, small shot of oxytocin. I felt good. So the person who gives gets to feel the benefits of oxytocin. The guy looked at me and said, thank you. The person who receives the act of generosity feels good. It feels nice when somebody does something, something nice for us, right? Small, act of, uh, small shot of oxytocin. Here's the best part. I get to the end of the block, true story. I'm standing, waiting to cross the street, and the guy standing in front of me turns around and says, I saw what you did back there. That was really cool. As it turns out, witnessing an act of human generosity releases oxytocin. This is the biology of pay it forwards. When we see someone do something great, this is why we feel good at the end of the, you know, the news, they do those feel good stories and we all feel good and we wanna go do nice things. And we, when you heard the story of painting the school, you're like, oh yeah, I should do more. That's nice, he's a nice guy. The best part about it is the more oxytocin you have in your body, not only do you feel good, but it actually inspires you to want to do things for somebody else. The more good we do for each other, the more it actually biologically inspires others to do good for each other also. And there's a reason for it. The human body is trying desperately to get us to look after each other. It makes us feel really good when we do nice things for each other. It makes us want to do th nice things for each other when we see other people do nice things for each other. It's trying to get us to look after the tribe with positive reinforcements, desperately trying to do it. The best part is the more oxytocin you have in your body, the stronger the relationships you have, you are less susceptible to addiction. People with strong relationships with lots of oxytocin in their bodies literally are just less susceptible to addiction. It makes us healthier. Oxytocin boosts our immune system. Couples live longer than single people. Happy people live longer than single people, or sad people, rather. <laughs> Happy people live longer than other people, seriously, right? There's less cases of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, simply for being happy. Oxytocin is responsible for that. It makes us better problem solvers. When we get along with the people, we're actually biologically better at solving complex problems. It is a powerful chemical, of course. The body is trying desperately to get us to love each other and look after each other. This is the value of what you have built. There's one more chemical I haven't told you about. It's called cortisol. 
the big C. Cortisol is the feeling of stress and anxiety. Cortisol is the first stage of fight or flight. It is the thing that makes us jump when we sense danger. We've all seen the nature documentary, and you see these gazelle out grazing in the field, and one of them thinks they hear a rustle in the grass, and what do they do? They go, <gasps> and it makes them hyper alert. It makes your heart start pounding. It fires glucose into your muscles, and it makes you tense. This is what we get when we feel stress, when we feel like there's danger out there, right? We're getting ready for fight or flight, and if we see something, we're either gonna run, or we're gonna go at it, right? We're getting ready for it. It's like an early warning alarm system, right? And because it's an early warning alarm system, if we, by working in a social world, everybody's attuned to the cortisol. So for example, when that gazelle goes, <gasps> all the other gazelle go, <gasps> and now all the gazelle are looking for danger, even though they didn't hear the original rustle. And one other one sees it and dashes and everyone lives another day. Good system. It's the same for us. What do you do when you hear a bump at the night? Bump in the night, you wake up, you go, <gasps> what's the first thing you do? <gasps> wake up! I heard a bump in the night. And that person who didn't hear the bump goes, <gasps> and they go looking for it, and their heart is pounding, and they become really tense just in case there's gonna be fight or flight, they don't know what it is. They become paranoid, it's one of the things cortisol does. It makes us paranoid. Find the danger, find the danger, what is it? Is it a burglar? I don't know, what is it? Same thing happens at work for so many companies. When there's the threat of layoffs, everybody's like, ah! and then guess what? Everybody goes, ah! and we become paranoid. I knew I shouldn't have spoken up in that meeting. And we become stressed, and we become tense, and we become self-interested. Cortisol inhibits the release of oxytocin. The more stress, the more anxiety we have at work. Literally, biologically, the less empathy we feel when we fear each other. And just like when you get waken up at night by that bump and you see that there's nothing out there, you go like this, you go, oh, the danger passes, you didn't need to fight, you didn't need to flight. The cortisol leaves your body, your heart rate returns to normal, and you relax. The paranoia goes away, you're good to go. The problem is, is that to get all that additional energy to make our hearts race and all that glucose and all the paranoia and all the heightened focused attention that all of our senses give us, we have to turn off non-essential systems to get it. So when cortisol fires into your veins, growth turns off, for example. You don't need your fingernails to grow at this moment. So it shuts it off. The other thing that cortisol shuts off is your immune system. In America today, we have some of the best hospitals, some of the best medicines, some of the best doctors, some of the best medical training, some of the best medical equipment in the world. And yet, why is it that heart disease is on the rise, cancer is on the rise, diabetes is on the rise? It's not partially hydrogenated oils. It's that most of our population are working in offices where they do not feel safe from each other they come to work stressed and anxious and worried that someone's going to hurt them, someone won't help them. They don't feel they can fall asleep at night and trust that people will watch their backs. They don't feel like their leaders would throw themselves on top of them if something bad happens. And so they're paranoid and they become self-interested, they become paranoid, and their health is affected. Literally, we are killing our own population because we do not have healthy cultures. We have cultures that are unbalanced. They're too much focused on the instant reward and they do not focus on the building of love and trust and loyalty. We do not look after each other. We're not building strong cultures and the result is that we cheat more, we get, we struggle, we have hard time solving problems, we become paranoid, we become self-interested and we affect our health. This is the danger. This is why I love this company. You are a shining example of what a balanced culture looks like, where all of the chemicals are doing the job as they were designed, where everybody comes to work and they not only achieve great things, but they feel like someone cares about them. You feel that management has your interest in mind. Most importantly, you talk about how much you care about each other and how you care that others care for you. When you talk to people like Johnny Bravo or the other heroes that have risked their lives or are willing to risk their lives for other people, I've asked them, why would you do it? Why would you sacrifice for someone else? They all say the same thing, because they would have done it for me. That's called trust. And what an amazing experience 
to go to work in a place where we can say that I know that they would have done it for me. That's why I would do it for them. It makes us feel calm. It makes us feel good. It makes us live longer. It makes us happier. It makes us care more. It makes us do nicer things. The reason you say, I love my job, will be biologically accurate. I love my job. I trust my leaders. I know that they would look out for me, and when it matters that they would sacrifice the numbers to protect the people, they would never sacrifice the people to protect the numbers. You are a shining example of the kind of companies that need to exist in our country a lot more than this one company. I have the privilege of getting to come here and see you and meet you and show a career Marine the Marine Corps is not the only place where people would sacrifice for each other. There are places in the private sector that look and feel exactly the same way. An organization not based on widgets, not based on what you do, but based on the values you share, a sense of belonging, a sense of trust, and a sense of commitment to each other, and the desire not to let each other down and to make each other proud. That those who invest in you, that you will work tirelessly to make them proud, and you in turn will pass on and protect them so that they will go on to do great things. It's like being a parent. Long before there were companies, long before there were nation states, the only thing we had were families. The best example of what a leader means is like a parent. It's the choice to sacrifice for someone else so that they may advance and accomplish more than we ever thought possible for ourselves. This is what it means to be a leader. It is not easy. In fact, it's incredibly difficult. But the choice when we undertake it is so rewarding. And as Bob said, for all the people that accuse me of being a crazy idealist, how can I be an idealist of the thing that I imagine exists in reality? It's an honor for me to know that you exist so that I get to talk about you and see you and share your story with others with the hope that the things that you're doing will inspire them to do the same. And the result will be a remarkable, remarkable country. Thank you very much.